Um, <clears throat> let's read this here, Romans 15, 14. <clears throat> I myself <clears throat> am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points, I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. That verse, verse 16, is we're going to come back and spend some time. Um, <clears throat> Verse 17, in Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God. So that from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I have no longer any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped in my journey there by you, once I've enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them, for if the Gentiles had come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Paul has been writing to them in Romans 14 and 15, the early part of 15, about the issue of food, sacrifice to idols, and, um, and the, issue, the issue of eating meat from the marketplace and and the differences that some Jewish believers and other Jewish believers and Gentile believers have, the differences of whether that's okay, whether that's acceptable, whether one can uh, please God by doing that, and there's differences among them. And uh, he has written them rather boldly on that, telling them uh, that uh, for example, in uh, verse 13 of Romans 14, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. Paul has not, remember, he's not been to Rome. He, he knows some of these people. And chapter 16 indicates some of the people. He knows them from various places where he's met them, but he doesn't know everybody. And he hadn't been to Rome yet. Here, in, in what we just read, he's reminding them, as he did in the first chapter of this letter, that he's planning to come to them, and he's been hindered from coming for a long time. But, you know, you, you write to a church or a group of people that you don't know, and you tell them, stop passing judgment on one another. <laughs> um, don't, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. I mean, this is rather bold. OK, uh, even going back earlier in the letter where he says in chapter two, look, if you're a Jew and, and you rely on the law, why don't you keep it? I mean, that's rather bold, isn't it, for the Jewish believers there? And then uh, when he says in, in chapter uh, seven, what shall we say? Is the law sin? Yeah, 
you know, what shall we say? Uh, shall we sin now that we're no longer under the law? I mean, he is speaking rather boldly in the letter. So he says here, Romans 15, 15, on some points I've written you very boldly by way of reminder. Well, I was reminding you of what you already know. When you read verse 14, you might think that, that that's a flattery. You know, sometimes we, we speak euphemistically. <laughs> you know, I, I know that you're great. Well, you're not really great, but it's a nice thing to say. <laughs> it kind of eases relationships, right? But in actual fact, here in verse 14, I'm satisfied about you uh, that you're full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to struck one another. Would, would be true of some of the people that he knew going to see that Priscilla and Aquila are there in Rome. Uh, in chapter 16, he, tell, he writes them and says, you know, uh, greetings to them. Priscilla and Aquila were used to instruct Apollos, the evangelist, to get his doctrine straight. <laughs> uh, we read that in the book of Acts. I mean, these are some mature believers that are among this congregation. We're going to see some of the others when we get into chapter 16. So, when he says, I'm satisfied you're full of goodness, the goodness here is the goodness of Christ. All right, he's been saying in chapter 13 to focus on what is good. Learn, learn what is good, what's pleasing to the Lord. Uh, filled with all knowledge. Uh, the all really means there the whole scope. It's not you know everything, okay? But it's the 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 topics of Christianity, the topics of the faith. You, you, you have a, a mature, you've received instruction on all these things. Um, you're able to teach. You're able to instruct one another. And confident that that's going on. But he says, I, what I have written, which is rather boldly, and you, you know, might be tempted to be put off a little bit. He says, um, I've done that by way of reminder. In other words, I'm expecting that you know this is true, <laughs> what I'm writing you. And uh, you should recognize that these things are true. And the reason is, <clears throat> verse 15, because of the grace given me by God. That's on your outline, the second point on apostolic authority. Um, he says, uh, I have written you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. I want to talk about this uh, ministry here, um, this apostolic authority and then the purpose of Paul's ministry. Uh, Paul is writing to them because he has apostolic authority. He's an apostle. Let me just think for a moment with you about us today reading Paul's letter. Um, there, there was a, a, um, a piece that was written in the second century. It was only discovered uh, in the 19th century that has the title, The Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, the and um, it's a little piece that was written in the second century. And it, it, what, what makes it real interesting is about church order. It talks about church order and, and th a lot of things like this. And it has an interesting line in it. It recognized that the apostles have, have disappeared from the scene. The last of them has died. Like I said, this is early second century. And, uh, and then it points out that the, the bishops, the pastors, and the teachers are doing for you the ministry that the apostles had. Well, <clears throat> how are they doing that? The way in which they're doing that 
is they're doing what Paul says in some of his other letters, where he exhorts the, the pastors, you know, the churches, that they are to be faithful in teaching the apostolic teaching that he has delivered to them. As an apostle, he has had a ministry of instructing the churches. That apostolic ministry, <clears throat> whereas the apostles have died and they've disappeared at the end of the first century, the ministry continues. Um, Paul says in Ephesians 2.20, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus being the chief cornerstone. The foundation of the apostles and prophets. And why? Because they are verbalizing instruction from Christ. Um, and so that apostolic ministry continues today. We're, we're receiving it in our study of Romans. When Paul says to these Roman Christians, you know, I, I understand that you, you know a whole breadth of Christian instruction and you're able to teach one another, but I'm reminding you because of my apostolic authority, that ministry of Paul is continuing to us today. Right here, many have studied God's word. You, you have had a lifetime of hearing the scripture, reading the scripture, memorizing the scripture, um, being in Bible studies. But when we open this letter of Paul, he's reminding us once again. And his ministry, his apostolic ministry, is still taking place, you see. Um, we're receiving that apostolic instruction as we open and hear the letter. So we have these Roman Christians. Paul is writing them out of his apostolic authority. That letter is continuing to successive generations of Christians who are being reminded wherever they are in their journey of learning God's word, they're going to hear some things from Paul that they already know, but they're also going to hear some things that are going to cause them to grow in their knowledge. And that's, that's where we are. This, um, the purpose of this ministry moves on into verse 16 here. <clears throat> we would expect him to say, by way of my reminder, because of the grace given to me by God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. That's what he said in the first chapter. Um, in fact, the first chapter parallels this part of Romans 15 very well. There's a lot of things that are repeated. But he says... Um, in um, chapter 1, that um, verse 5, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all nations. We've received grace and apostleship. See here in chapter 15, verses 15 and 16, because of the grace given me by God, we expect him to say to be an apostle. But he says a minister. You say, okay, so apostles are ministers, right? But here's the interesting thing about this. This word minister is not the typical word minister or servant, which is diakonos, which is a servant. A doulos is a servant. It's a bond slave type servant. And Paul often refers to himself that way. This is to be a liturgos. Um, that word minister is normally translated priest. Okay. To be a minister, some of your translations will say a priestly minister. 
and say, okay, well, that's one of the words that could be used here, but let's just follow this out a little bit. To be a minister of Christ Jesus in the priestly service, that actually is a good translation of the Greek word. It's a priestly service of the gospel so that the offering that word offering <clears throat> is the offering up like a sacrifice is offered. Okay? An offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So my question to you, is Paul saying that he's a priest? Well, he's not a Jewish priest because he's not a Levite. We know in Philippians 3, he says he's a Benjamite. He's of the tribe of Benjamin. So he's not a Levite. So he's not saying, you know, I was a Levite. You know. But he is saying, and, and by the way, in, in the Old Testament, not all Levites were priests, but the priests were Levites. Okay, They were of the tribe of Levi, but they were Aaronic. You know, they were part of the family of Aaron, but uh, there were other Levites. Okay? But he's not even of an Aaronic type of priest or a Zadok, Zadokian priest. He is a, he's a Benjamite. But he calls himself as an apostle. He says, I'm a, um, a liturgos in the priestly service of the gospel so that the offering of the Gentiles may be accepted. So is Paul saying that he's a priest as a Christian minister? Okay, I want to raise the question that way, and then I want to make a, a point about interpretation. And this is where I need my board, okay? So uh, I'm going to move this just a little bit, Zoomer, so hopefully you can see, and Doug, you can tell me whether they can see. Um, but um, let's see if we can write this thing here. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll make a window just a little bit. Is that okay? Okay. So <clears throat> here's Paul's uh, term uh, priest. Priest, we're Baptists. So when we hear a minister is a priest, we think, no. Okay. <laughs> Why do we think that? <clears throat> because uh, we're in a history of interpretation, right? And so when we think of this term, our most recent and our current context is Roman Catholicism, okay? Which has priests and sees Christian ministers as priests. And so when we say, our ministers are not priests, we mean we're not that kind of priest, okay? What is, can, can the Zoom see that, more or less? <laughs> when, uh, when, when we ask the question, well, what kind of priest is that, okay? That kind of priest, in their understanding of the word priest, what the priest is doing is the priest comes into the worship, so what we call the worship service, the service, and the priest offers up the mass. Okay. In Roman Catholic theology, the mass, uh, that is the, the, the bread and so on that they offer up, is the body of Christ. It actually is really, not symbolically, but actually in their view, this goes back to most clearly to the 14th century, but there's some elements earlier on uh, that feed into this, but that, that 
this bread has changed in substance, that's transubstantiation, has become Christ. It's actually his body. And the Reformation debates and, and the traditional denominational debates about the Lord's Supper all revolve around, is this so? And uh, what alternate interpretation one might have of the Lord's Supper, the, the bread and the wine? So in the Roman Catholic theology, the priest is offering the sacrifice of Christ, Christ's body, sacrificed for you, like the Old Testament priests offer an offering on the altar that the sacrificial victim is offered there, and that's what creates atonement. I believe that when the priest offers it up, that it changes right at that point into Christ, who is crucified again for you. That's why um, Baptists and others often cite uh, in the book of Hebrews, Christ who died once for all, not multiple times, okay? Uh, so in the Reformation, and especially the Radical Reformation, the Anabaptists, and later the Baptists, and so on, we're not priests, our ministers are not priests, because they're not doing that, okay? The problem is that we, we see back here in Romans, Romans 15, Paul is using the term apostolic priest, and it's almost impossible to understand what he's talking about, <laughs> because we think, well, it's, you know, well, that's just wrong. Uh, the problem is, you know, and this might even be cited by these people as some kind of justification for the use of the language. My point to you is Paul's not talking about that. He's not talking about a Christian minister who offers up what we call the Lord's Supper, or they call the Mass, or the Eucharist, or whatever. They call it that. They offered it up, and it changes into Jesus dying for you once again, right there. By the way, in that Roman Catholic understanding of the priestly ministry, you have to eat that in order to get grace into you like a medicine. Okay? Uh, it's, a, it's a medicinal type of transfer of grace, you eat it to get grace in you, so it can change you in your behavior. But only these people can give it to you. You can't get it anywhere else. So that whole conception of ministry is a problem. But when we go back to Paul, Paul is using the word priest, but he's not using it in this sense. He's using it in a different sense. And it's a sense that here is, we're going to skip these people, and we're going to go back to the apostle. Let's get apostolic instruction. Let's let Paul tell us how he's using this term. And by the way, he never says that, he never writes to Timothy. Remember, Timothy, you're a priest. He never uses the term of the pastor's you know, he doesn't say in 1 Timothy 3 or in Titus 1, where he gives a list of pastoral qualifications and pastoral instruction. He says in 1 Timothy 5 about the, the elders uh, who rule and who teach, and they do all these kinds of things. Here's, here's um, ministerial activity, non-apostolic ministerial activity. He never calls them, remember, you're priests. He never says that. But he does say of his ministry that he has this priestly ministry. And this is not the only place he does that. We'll, we'll mention a couple more in just a moment. Let's look very closely here at, at, at uh, 1516 and I'll just this as I may need to with the Zoomers. <clears throat> uh, the priestly service of the gospel so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. What he's talking about <clears throat> is that he 
as an apostle to the Gentiles, is offering to God, not the mass, not any of that. He's offering the Gentiles. Now, I don't think, I don't think any of us here are Jewish. Uh, I think we're all Gentiles. So let's bring this right on down to us, hearing the apostolic ministry and being reminded here in the 21st century. Paul's apostolic ministry is to present us as an offering to God. Isn't that interesting? That the church is, that the purpose of the ministry is to present the church, the people, like an offering to God, acceptable and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And you get your mind around that, you see a purpose for ministry that's not often mentioned. His ministry is not done, he says, until these Gentiles are lifted up and given over like an apostle. He's giving us over to God sanctified by the Holy Spirit, acceptable to God. What's an acceptable uh, uh, sacrifice? One that's without blemish. Remember that in the Old Testament? Look what he says in uh, Philippians. Philippians 2. He says... um, Philippians 2.14, do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish. See that language, blameless and without blemish? Or a sacrifice that acceptable God is without blemish. Blameless and without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I'm to be poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all, and you should be glad and rejoice with me. The sacrificial offering is you and your faith being lifted up and presented to God as a blameless and without blemish offering for whom Paul here says, I'm like a drink offering poured out upon you. Remember that in the Old Testament, you had several offerings, and there might be the the burnt offering and the the, uh, wave offering and the grain offering, but the drink offering was poured out on the altar with the other offering. He says, that's that's me and my ministry. I'm just poured out (laughs) with you in the offering up of you and your faith in God. Isn't that a beautiful picture? This is why he says back in chapter 12, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your your, your reasonable service. So you are holy and acceptable to God. His work in us Paul's work to us as recipients of his apostolic ministry is that we are so instructed that we offer ourselves as living sacrifices, pleasing to God, holy and acceptable to God. And Paul says that is his, Paul's ministry, preparing us and offering up us to God to be pleasing to the Lord. Look, there are a lot of um, ministry goals and ministry objectives 
there's lots of things to do in ministry. But the apostolic ministry is to present us as holy to God. And if the earliest church, as I mentioned this letter from the second century, was actually getting it right when they said that the, the pastors and the teachers are performing to you the work of the apostles now that the apostles have died off, then that would say that the purpose of pastoral and teaching ministry in the church is to present to you the scripture, in this case, Paul, who then still exercises his ministry of presenting us to God, holy and acceptable to him. So, <clears throat> Is there a priestly ministry? Well, there is. It's not the one many people think of <laughs> when they think of, you know, priests. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. That's so interesting to hear Paul talk about. I mean, this is the person who in Romans 3 says there's no place for boasting. There is no place for boasting. And didn't he say in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace we are saved through faith, um, not of works, lest any man should boast. I mean, Paul is the no boasting zone. I mean, you know, we just put that no boasting here. And here he says, I have reason to boast. Actually, the word proud is the word boast uh, of my work for God. How so? Well, <laughs> got to understand in verse 18, um, I won't speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, what Christ has done to me, through me. What tells you <clears throat> that this apostolic ministry is actually what's happening is through Paul, Jesus himself is working. Jesus is working through Paul to bring the Gentiles to obedience. Now, if that's so, why would you even, how does boasting even come into this? How, how could it be proud of my, how could it be my work in verse 17? If verse 18, it's Christ working to me, okay? This is very parallel to Ephesians um, Two, I'm sorry, Galatians 2, 20, where he says, uh, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. He says in Colossians 1 that the purpose of his ministry is so that you will know Christ in you. The hope of glory, Christ working in you. Okay. Well, <clears throat> That working of Christ in us is by faith. It, it's, not, um, it's not that we're puppets. You know, a puppet doesn't move unless a hand is in there moving it. Okay? It's otherwise, it's just that's not there. There's nothing there. <laughs> okay? That's not the case here. We, we're actually real people, and the work of Christ in us is Christ working, involving a relational aspect to us that in the New Testament describes is by faith. But faith is, a, is actually an active faith. And Paul <clears throat> is exercising his own faith in Christ, by which Christ works through him to do this ministry of bringing the Gentiles to obedience. And this obedience is necessary in order that verse 16 happen, that is, that they be presented as an offering to God, because the offering is holiness. They're a holy people. Well, you're holy people as you're obedient. But this obedience can only be done by Christ. In fact, it's what he said in Romans 1 when he says, uh, Romans 1, 5, 
Uh, we have received from Jesus Christ, our Lord, grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the Gentiles, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, you and Rome. The obedience of faith is the key term. Um, we'll talk about it. It appears again right at the end of the letter, the last two verses of the letter in chapter 16, this obedience of faith. And it wraps the whole thing up. But it's an obedience that takes place by faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul's ministry, Christ working in him, takes place by his, Paul, the apostle, his faith in Christ, who then works through him to bring about in you and me the obedience of faith. He says, um, verse 18, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Holy Spirit, by power of word and deed. So that includes his letters, as well as his speaking and his writing by word. Very interesting about his words we read in uh, 1 Corinthians 2. He says, um, um, 1 Corinthians 2.12, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God, and we impart this in words. He's speaking of himself, the apostle. The things from God, which the Spirit has taught us, we imparting them to you in words. These words, 1 Corinthians 2.13, are not taught by human wisdom. They are taught by the Spirit in expressing spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. This is Paul saying, the words that I'm giving are words taught by the Holy Spirit. So this is Christ working through the apostle. This is that part of inspiration, why we say the scripture is inspired. is because the apostolic word is coming to us by a ministry of the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul. Um, <clears throat> what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles obedience by word and by deed. His word and deed, the things that he did, uh, does, um, the Verse 19 goes in here to the power of signs and wonders. Signs and wonders are very interesting because it appears, that phrase, signs and wonders, appears in two places in the Bible. One, in the book of Exodus. Two, in the Gospels and Acts. Okay. In other words, in the history of the Bible, the display of signs and wonders come in two crucial moments. Now, we could add a third when we consider it here, but uh, I'll mention that in a moment. But two crucial moments, one in the Exodus, where God displays signs and wonders when he brings Israel out of, out of Egypt. The other is when the Messiah appears. The third interlude in all of this is Elijah and Elisha. It's not something that's always happening in the history of the Bible. Now, there are miracles that happen all through the history. But this phrase, this, this, this particular phrase, is, is at certain moments. And they are an attestation of authority. Okay? By the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. Now, <clears throat> Zoomers, um, 
what I would do is ask you, if you have your Bible there, and you can do this in room if you want to as well, turn to the maps portion of your Bible. And in the maps portion, you will have a map of the journeys of Paul, map of the ministry of Paul. Now, exactly which map it is, I don't know, because you have different Bibles, but if you thumb through your maps, you'll see they go, they start with Old Testament and they go to New Testament, and somewhere toward the last of the maps will be Paul's journeys, okay? Now, in the room, we have one on the board here, and I'm not going to turn the camera to see that, but uh, you are here in the room can see uh, right here, this is the journeys of Paul. Now, where is Illyricum? Well, it's not mentioned on this map, and in fact, in your, in your Bible, you probably won't have it. Some of you might have it. Where it is is right here. Up it's north of Macedonia. That's where Illyricum is. So here's Jerusalem. Where, there it is. And Illyricum's up here. You see these uh, arrows? These are the journeys of Paul. See how it's kind of a, a ellipse? See how it's going? So he says all around. Okay. All around, that's just elliptical. <laughs> okay, from Jerusalem to Illyricum. That, that's a very significant movement right there. So he says, I've been ministering all the way up here. I now want to come to Rome. Uh, and Rome is over here. <laughs> okay, it's in Italy. And I want to then go to Spain. Okay, so we're going further, further to the west. Um, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. The ministry of the gospel of Christ, by the way, is completed not when you made an initial decision. It's completed when you're presented to God as holy. That's the ministry of the gospel, Paul. I want to present the Gentiles as holy. Okay, so <clears throat> he says, I've been fulfilling that ministry. What does that tell you? He's been working real hard to present these Gentiles as holy <laughs> uh, from all those places, and he's paid for it big time, uh, being thrown into prison and stoned and all kinds of stuff. But all of this by word and deed, which means that he has to model it. I want, I want to fulfill that ministry. Um, let's just move on here. Um, so I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. Uh, I think we will stop here. Well, let me just get this this um, this text he quotes, and then we'll we'll repeat. We'll, we'll come back to chapter fifteen and, and finish it next week. But <clears throat> let me just um, look at this here. He says, "I want to. I want. It's my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation." There are a lot of people who quote this. A lot of young path young ministers in seminary today like to quote this verse. And uh, what they mean by it is, you know, when you go into an existing church, there's all kinds of traditions, because we don't have anything like that here at First Dallas. But anyway, there's all kinds of traditions, you know, <laughs> that, you know, a, a pastor, you know, has to deal with, you know, and kind of get used to. And all this kind of thing. it's, you know, it's so great just to go work, just start a new, just start a new, you know, just start a new, you know, ministry. And uh, does God bless that? Yeah, absolutely does. Um, but sometimes we have to remind them that, you know, <laughs> there are ministries to the existing churches. And, uh, but what is Paul talking? Is that what Paul meant? 
you know, hey, I, I don't want to be bothered by somebody's tradition. You know, somebody has gone in there and set this up and I, I don't want to have to do anything. You know, I don't. Paul's not talking about that. What is he talking about? He's talking about this right here. As it is written, those who have never been told of him will see and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I've so often been hindered from coming to you. You know where this comes from? Your Bibles usually will have in font too small to read. You, know, you have to get out your magnifying glass to read the verse reference. <laughs> yes, that happens to me, okay. <laughs> uh, but it's in Isaiah uh, 52 and 53. It's that 52, 53 is the fourth servant song. It's the fourth prophecy about the coming Messiah as the servant of God. And this is the long one, that he will give his life for the sins of the people. And in there, it's talking about kings, rulers of the earth who never heard about it. He said they were, you know, it's like they will slap their face in awe. I never heard of something like that. What an incredible word. What an incredible story. What an incredible mes message that is that God would do that. He would send his only son to die for my sins for the sins of the world, it says those who, who have never heard such a thing, we'll see. Paul says when he makes this ambition, he wants to be part of the fulfillment of prophecy. Isn't that interesting? The fulfillment of prophecy. You know how that prophecy is fulfilled when we continue to take the gospel out in our own community and around the world, and there are still people who've never heard and in our culture, which is intentionally secular, they don't want the Bible talked about in the school. They don't want it, you know, get it out of the, out of the media, get it out of the educational system. We have a more and more people coming of age in our own society who've never heard this. When we present the gospel, we take the gospel to them, we're actually participating in prophecy fulfillment. Those who have not heard will hear and understand. Well, we'll stop there at this point. I thought maybe I could get all the way through it, but I couldn't because I went to the whiteboard. It took up time, but Hopefully you find something of that interesting. We have uh, maybe a minute or two for the intent and purpose of your apostle, uh, whose letter that we've been reading, who has written with you working through him to present us words and a word, a message that is actually from God, from Christ to us. We see the intent and the purpose that we might be a holy people. We rejoice in the wonderful grace that we have that we've learned about and been reminded of in this letter, the grace of justification by faith, that we stand righteous not by our works, but as a gift from God. We also read about the working of your Holy Spirit in us that we might walk with you in the death and the resurrection of Christ, and that we are taught and trained to present ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God with renewed minds by your Spirit. So, Lord, please grant uh, as we walk with you this week that we might be not only your servants, but an offering that is pleasing to the Lord. And we know that it's not because of us, but it's Christ working in us. Even as Paul himself spoke of himself and his own ministry. Lord, please grant that we walk with you, that the Lord be honored, and that the word of Christ yet go out from us to those who have not heard, 
And even those who have heard but have not yet come to faith may yet come to know you in the wonderful grace of the Lord Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.